I welcome you all to this service of commemoration, 75th anniversary of the evacuation of Dunkirk. I'm privileged to have met men who were brought off the beaches at Dunkirk. I was expected that about 25,000 would be saved from advance on Nazis, and all more than a third of a million were saved. Men rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk, both British and French. Much of the success of Operation Dynamo, as it was called, was due to planning and organisation of the best African Bandit. He was also instrumental in organising Operation Overlord, the DD landings. We meet today to remember the Dunkirk evacuate. Oh, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start again. <laughs> we meet today to remember the Dunkirk evacuation 75 years ago, just last week. And also the 71st anniversary of D Day, which is yesterday. Today we thank God for Admiral Ramsey's service and his skill. And we also remember all those who served the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force to make such a success. I said that I've I said that I've met men who were rescued. I've also met men who worked in the little ships, who risked their lives to save their troops. We remember all these sailors with thanks. So let us now listen to the word of God, which tells about men and ships, about worried about sinking in a storm. We know what you'll allow it. Thank you. that we were to sail for Italy, they transferred Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion. Embarking on a ship that was about to set sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea. When a moderate south wind began to blow, they weighed anchor and began to sail past the ports close to the shore. Close to the shore. A soon violent wind called the Northeaster rushed down from Crete. Since the, ship was... Since the ship was caught and could not be turned with its head to the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. And indeed, God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've been told. But we will have to run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were drifting across the Sea of Adria, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. In the morning, they did not recognise the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. Striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was, that all were brought safely to land. 
After we had reached safety, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And now let us unite together in the front of worship of God by singing Eternal Father, strong to save, which is on your order service. Eternal Father, strong to save. branch of that family. Um, my great-grandfather, who was um, Francis Ramsey, married Georgina Hume of Wedderburn, and that was how first the um, link to Berkshire started. And my father came here to visit the Humes, I think, several times, and he met my mother, Margaret Meese of Keynes. Uh, we, of course, marched with Keynes here, and uh, so really that solidified the link. 
and they were married in 1929. My grandfather, uh, who was um, called William Ramsey, who was a colonel at that time, became a brigadier general, guarded the fourth hazards of India in the late 1890s. And the reason I'm telling you this is because one of his subaltern officers, no less than the Chairman of Princeton he would refer to my father uh, as uh, my own colonel's son. Now, during that time when my grandfather was aboard, my father, who was the fourth of five children, was left behind. There wasn't much money around. And he joined the Royal Naval College Britannia, which you could do when you were... <coughs> Uh, 15 or 16 and train and um, education. <coughs> he had a great naval career, including commanding five different ships, one of which was indeed based in Malta, it was called HMS Dini. The last one was that ship called HMS Royal Sovereign. He was then made a rare admiral and appointed chief of the staff of the Home Fleet in the mid 1930s. <coughs> His commander in chief, who was called Admiral Sir Roger Blackhouse, was an old fashioned man. And uh, he said to my father, Well, I'll refer such matters as I consider appropriate to you, whereas under the modern South system, it's supposed to be the other way around. And uh, my father, after a while, asked to be, uh, have his appointment changed and he was put on the non-active list for two years from 1936 to 1938. As it happened, my mother inherited a house from a bachelor, meaning me and his uncle. Yeah, at that time. <coughs> but he had two years of R&R, &R, um, was able to play golf, do country sports and enjoy horses and so on. In 1938, uh, they purchased Fouchard here, and he also became the Chevy of Port Admiral Dover in the event of war. <coughs> in 1939, he uh, became full time at Dover, and as has already mentioned, been mentioned, the Dunkirk evacuation achieved far more. And it was expected to, in fact, it was 338,000 troops, most of whom were British, but not by any means all, that were. And the little ships uh, played a very big part in collecting them from the beaches. As it happens, wife Mary and I were in Ramsgate and Dover for celebrations two weeks ago. And it was a great honour and privilege to be there. <coughs> From there, he went on to do the Sicily landings and the North African landings. I can remember him occasionally coming home in an airplane and landing at Charter Hall Airfield, as it was, it was really exciting for me as a small boy. He became the Allied Naval Commander in Chief for D Day in 1944, working alongside Eisenhower, Montgomery, and Lee Mallory, and had his headquarters at a place called Southwick Park. Now, <coughs> which still belongs to the, uh, to the military actually, and has still got big maps and things in it. He kept the channel clear uh, after D Day, and um, uh, in November 1944, he actually commanded the operation to capture the island of Walter in the, the Shelf they brought us to France in late 1944. Unfortunately, he was killed in his plane uh, there on the second of the morning of the plane stalled and everyone on board was killed. <coughs> he had never really received the plane he should have done. In fact, he got no reward from his own country, although he did get quite high awards from the United States, France, and he won't believe it. In Russia. 
His first biography called Full Cycle was published in, um, I think, 1959. <coughs> and we hope for the new one, which could be called um, Neptune's Admiral, because Neptune was the naval part of, of uh, Bebo, by someone called Andrew Gordon, may come out this year. Um, so enough for me, it's wonderful to pay tribute to my father, but I would also like to very briefly to pay tribute to my mother, who was a wonderful person, and uh, who, after the war, but she was, she was a good deal younger than my father, gave her life to looking after this place and developing, for not least, this garden here, uh, and looking after my mother and myself. On the 24th of August 1939, Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey was appointed Flag Officer Dover. Having served as part of the Dover Patrol in World War I, he knew the channel well. Shortly after his arrival in Dover, he wrote to his wife, my grandmother, that he had no stationery, books, typists, or machines, maddening communications, and nothing but long-retired officers or volunteers. Eight months later, when Germany invaded the Low Countries, he put into operation his plan for bringing the retreating British Army back from France. This involved assembling 845 boats, over 500 of which were civilian and included yachts, barges and dinghies, which in nine days evacuated a third of a million British and French soldiers who formed the core of experienced soldiers who proved vital for winning the war. He received many letters of congratulations, including from Churchill and Lord Broad, the general in charge of the British Expeditionary Force, who wrote, We in the BEF can only say thank you, and in doing so, we shall never forget an achievement which will live forever in the annals of the sea. Perhaps the most succinct and apt was from his brother-in-law. Thousands of men, women and children will be grateful to you and your men for the rest of their lives. While a soldier's wife wrote to him, even if you had time, please do not answer this, but I feel I must thank you for rescuing my old boy. It's excellent that there are representatives and standards of the services here today. In addition to the supreme maritime effort, we must not forget the crucial roles of the Army in covering the withdrawal and prolonging the evacuation, and of the RAF in protecting the troops and seamen below them. Exactly 75 years ago today, three days after the evacuation ended, he sent a telegram here to my grandmother. Lady Ramsey, I'm proud to be the first to congratulate you on your new title. He went on to plan the North African and Sicilian landings before becoming the Allied Naval Commander of D-Day. It was fitting that he was chosen to send the Allies back to France in 1944, after bringing them back from France in 1940. For D-Day, he led the largest amphibious operation the world had ever seen, and probably will ever see, with 4,126 vessels, which it also in nine days landed half a million men and 77,000 vehicles. One evening, a week before D-Day, Ramsey and his driver pulled over to the side of a road on a promontory overlooking Portsmouth where they could see the convoys passing and the ships loading in the distance. Admiral Ramsey looked on pensively for what seemed a long time and then remarked, it is a tragic situation, but this is a scene set for terrible human sacrifice. But if out of it comes peace and happiness, who would have it otherwise? 
On the evening of 5th of June, he wrote in his diary, I am under no delusions as to the risks involved in this most difficult of operations. And the critical period around HR, when, if initial formations of landing craft are held up, success will be in the balance. We shall require all the help that God can give us. By way of relief, my grandfather wrote on the 12th of June to his wife, no doubt it is natural to congratulate the head of the concern, but it only serves to remind me of the many people on whom success depended quite as much, if not more, than on myself. At the same time, I realised that in the event of failure, it would equally be all attributed to me. That he was killed in January 1945 in a plane crash in France was a terrible tragedy for his wife, my grandmother, and their two young sons, my father and uncle, who are both here today. But it was also a cruel curtailment of a great leader's life. Eisenhower called Ramsey a most competent commander of courage, resourcefulness, and tremendous energy. Berwickshire should be proud of him. Sadly, he was never able to have a much-earned retirement at this magnificent place. So I was delighted to be able to give him a retirement of sorts by acquiring the statue of him, a second version of the one at Dover Castle, looking over the channel towards Dunkirk. But today is not just about him. This statue of one person who happens to be wearing a naval uniform represents the huge sacrifice of, in World War II of every single soldier, sailor, airman, wife, mother, father, sister, brother, and child. Irrelevant of whether they were involved in the Dunkirk evacuation we are remembering today. We will remember them. I said earlier that I've met men who were rescued from Lundkirk. I'm privileged to meet them. I've also met families of those who died at Dunkirk, both of the army and the civilian sailors. So today we not only remember those who were saved, but also those who lost their husbands, their sons, their fathers. We should never forget others who died later in the war so that today we can meet in peace. As we heard, Admiral Ramsey also died later on in the war. So let us now remember those who served us so many years ago. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, on this day we commemorate the those who lived and died in the service of others. We are glad to remember that thy purposes for us are good. For thou didst give thy Son, Jesus Christ, for the life of the world. Thou leads us by the Holy Spirit into a path of righteousness and of peace. O God, in thy great goodness, thou hast brought us to this day. And we thank thee for thy protecting love by which we are sustained in freedom. In time of trouble, when we cry to thee, thou didst hear us. <laughs> and now give us saviours who saved us out of the hands of our enemies. Grant us, O Lord, to walk ever worthy of their sacrifice. And help us never to forget those who gave us their time, their talents, and even their lives, so that we may walk freely today. O Father, we thank thee for all thy gifts to us, not only for this lovely part of the world, but also for all of creation. The hills, the rivers, the seas, the fish, the birds, the animals, the people, and especially, O oh God, for making us. Each one of us is unique, and we thank Thee, O oh Father, for creating us with our own individual skills, our talents, our characters. Help us to use them for the benefit, not only of ourselves, but also for the benefit of our friends, our families, our country, and the whole world. Almighty God, we 
off towards all people as one us in the world of Jesus Christ, and whose spirit works in everything that's good. We acknowledge thy presence with us today, and we confess with shame that sometimes we take for granted the peace that surrounds us. And those times are not worthy of the sufferings endured in our defence, or the sacrifice made by these young men and women of many years ago, and of those in the not too distant past and still less worthy of the sacrifice of thy son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, we give thee thanks today for all thy saints, for all thy faithful servants, but in particular today for those who laid down their lives for our sake, whom you have gathered into the peace of thy presence. Especially today we thank thee for those whom we have known, whose memory we treasure. Let the memory of their devotion be an example to us, that we may be taught to live by them who learn to die, and at last we, being faithful unto death, may receive with them the crown of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our daily bread. Remembrance. Days have grown at old, as ways are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
Remember the Sunday when the, the, the technician of the British Forces Broadcasting Service and um, um, we were broadcasting a live remembrance service and he sort of dozed off as the service went on and he came to when there was a, nothing was happening. It all gone quiet. So he put on some pop music during the silence. I think the, probably the bird song was more of a blessing. The events that we were gathered here to remember today may have taken place 400 miles to the south, but of course the effect of the Second World War was felt here in Bouncer and across Scotland, the UK, the Commonwealth and around the world. The success of the evacuation of the only of course, to the beaches on the other side of the English Channel. And this did not include the men of 51st Highland Division, commanded by General Fortune, who was forced to surrender on the 12th of June 1940 to Rommel at St. Valery. 10,000 men of the 51st Division were taken prisoner. The fall of France left Scotland in a vulnerable position with the absence of so many men and the fear that Hitler would attack Scotland using Norway as a jumping off point. When exiles from Poland and Eastern Europe, European countries came here, they were made very welcome by way of filling the gap. In Berwickshire, 16,000 of the 1st Battalion Armoured Cavalry Regiment, known as the Black Devils, were billeted at Nine Wells Estate at Churnside, which belonged to the Hume family, and also with other local residents. In Nine Wells, there is a memorial containing the names of 127 Polish men killed in battle, which has the inscription for our freedom and yours. The 22nd Artillery Supply Company of the Polish 11th Corps was billeted at Winfield Aerodrome. They numbered 3,000, or perhaps after the war, 3,000 were named. Bless our young people. May they never see the flames of war or know the depths of cruelty to which men and women can sink. Grant them in their generation that they may be faithful soldiers and servants of Jesus Christ. Bless our friends and those who were our enemies, who suffered or are still suffering from war. Grant that your love may reach out to the wounded, the disabled, the mentally distressed, and those whose faith has been shaken by what they have seen and endured. Comfort all who mourn the death of loved ones, all who miss the comradeship of friends. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless those in authority in every land, 
Give them the wisdom to know and the courage to do what is right. Encourage those who work for peace, who strive to improve international relations, who seek new ways of reconciling people of different race and color and creed. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to whom with you the Father and the Holy Spirit be all praise and glory, world without end. Amen. And we stand to sing our closing hymn, I vow to thee my tongue. <coughs> I bow to thee, my country, all the great things of love. And his power and gold and earth, the best of his soul, my love. The love that asks no question, the love that stands the test, that lays upon thee. Thank you very much.